upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the verses to you before we start singing our next song. I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 1. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he's called. His holy people who are rich and in his glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else. Not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Amen. This song may be new to you, but I want you to learn it and let it penetrate your heart. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there's peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your the top and sing it again. I want to speak the name of Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there's peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Every 
some praise of God. Hallelujah, Lord. So, and it's after the service, so no eating your picnic during church. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, only kids get to eat snacks during church. Hi, Wesley. Okay, Ladies' Day is L at LPC this Saturday. If you want to go, you just need to contact the camp to register, and that is good to go. Um, they will have all your, the details and how much it costs and all that. Pastor Al and Eileen's 65th wedding anniversary is on Saturday. Yeah, you should clap. <laughs> That's a pretty big deal. So, um, so cards are, I guess, detailed cards for the event is, are on the Welcome Center. So if you know them well and you want to be a part of that, details are on the Welcome Center. Now... My last announcement, VBS is coming up really fast, but you know what? We can't have a VBS without kids at the VBS. So this week, there will be a big sign going up out front with the fluorescent letters. You probably have seen them around town. We'll have one of those out front with our cool boat that's also going to be out there. But here's where you can help. If you have neighbors, that's the key word of the day, neighbors. If you watch Sesame Street, the word of the day, it's neighbors. So if you, have, yeah, you should all repeat after me, neighbors. Neighbors. There you go. So if you do have neighbors or friends or relatives that live in the area that have kids that are between the ages of 5 and 11, I have these cards that you can take to hand out so that they know how to access um, VBS and how to get their kids signed up. Also, if you know families that might not have a lot of money and kids can't go to camp, this is kind of the perfect thing because it costs very, very little. If they don't have any money, it will cost them nothing. Um, we're asking for a small fee from people who can't afford it just to help offset the cost, but it's only $5 if you sign up be before August 5th and $10 after. But I have 100 of these cards and I would really like you to take some today and hand them to families that you might think would like to come to VBS. Okay, now, on that note, all the kids, I would like you to come up and keep me company for a few minutes, if you don't mind. Come on, come on, come on. Don't be shy. I don't bite, I promise. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, you're going to have to sit down so everyone around you can see. I know it's for you, but... Adults like to see too. Come on up, don't be shy, don't be shy. Is everybody here? You can bring your parents if you're too shy to come. Okay, all right. I'm gonna tell you a kind of a cool story this morning. And we are not going to light the church on fire while we do it. <laughs> okay, so we all know, disclaimer, that we don't play with fire, right? No, correct, all right, so. But for today's lesson, only me. <laughs> Okay, okay, shh, okay, shh, 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 okay, are you ready? Here we go, okay, so these, we're going to pretend that these lighters, these are people, so one is one person and one is another person, 
and they are, the word of the day is? Neighbors. So they are neighbors. Now, one of these neighbors, it's, I'm going to have to move the microphone with me so you can hear. Okay, one of these neighbors is going through a really hard time. They're getting bullied at school. That's no fun. They fell off their bike, and their bike broke, and now they don't have a bike anymore, and that's very sad. But they might win a new one at VBS. But they could. If they came to VBS and learned their verses, they could win a new one. Plug. We're terrible. Okay. Now, they, their mom is very sick, so she can't make dinner, and she can't do the normal things, so she is sick, and it's not very fun. Um, and they're just really, really sad. Do you know what happens when you're really, really sad and you're going through hard times? You do cry. But you know what else? What happens is your light doesn't turn on anymore because you're sad and you don't have it to give. But you know what? When another neighbor comes along and they bring a meal, they bring a meal or they just sit with them while they cry, because sometimes you just need someone to cry with you, or they are just supportive. They share their bike with the person that doesn't have one because that's a really nice thing to do. And you know what then happens? Is that they help light the other person's light. Did you know that that's like sharing the love of Jesus with other people in practical ways? That is <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, now. Before you um, go running out, in case you missed it, we're not going downstairs today. We're going to stay upstairs. But here's a catch. In case you didn't get a special package that's on the table out in the foyer, you can walk and get one because there are special coloring with word searches and all the things about, what's the word of today? Neighbor. All about being a good neighbor. Okay, away you go. Thank you for not burning the church down. I think. <laughs> and thank you to uh, each one of you again for joining us today. Yes, the word of the day is neighbor. And uh, the question that I'm going to uh, answer today to the Holy Scripture, that question, hey pastor, how do I love my neighbor? And before we do, I do want to do a little neighborly thing here and uh, just uh, want to bless and uh, call the church to pray for Miss Abigail and her daughter, Ethel. Abigail, are you here? Lights are pretty strong here. Right at the, would you stand? She's right at the back. I'm going to ask you to stand just for a second. Abigail and Ethel are going to be leaving us. They've been with us for a while, but uh, Abigail has decided to go back to school again. And so they're moving to Kingston so she can do her nursing studies. So would you, um, following the service, would you make sure that you get over and bless her, say, you know, say something kind to her, and let's send her on the way with the love of Church on the Hill. God bless you richly. We'll continue to pray for you in your studies and wish you every success. You will do well. You've got the heart of a nurse. Uh, that's Christ working through you, right? Caring for others, and uh, that's awesome. So, all right. So, congratulations on the studies, and uh, big move. We're going to be uh, not happy to see you guys leaving, though, but uh, glad that you're following your dreams and uh, the will of God. I really think it is. Let's turn to uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 13 here. John chapter 13, answering the question, hey pastor, how do I love my neighbor? And as I said last week, um, although the question is posed as, hey pastor, it's, uh, I'm going to answer it from the Word of God, right? So, examples, models, commands, instructions from the Word of God on how do you love your neighbor. John chapter 13, Jesus knew, the context here real quick, that his hour had come and that he was about to leave the earth and go back to the Father. Uh, Jesus had this little chat with Judas, his betrayer, first. Um, and then after Judas leaves the room, Jesus turns to his disciples, those who were still committed to following him. All right? 
So he turns to those who are committed to following him, and we're going to read his instructions, verse 34 and 35, in just a second. But I hope that today you are here because you, like the 11 that stayed in the room that day, that you are committed to following Christ. Hopefully you were here last week and we talked about, hey, how do I follow Jesus? And that's what you're committed to do. And so uh, that's what we want to do. Let's read verse 34 and 35. uh, John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35 says this. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. In verse 35, by this will all know that you are my disciples, or those who follow me, right, from last week, if you have love one for another. Let's pray. Father, as we've turned to your word, we turn our hearts, O God, in submission over to your spirit now. We ask, O God, that you would make us more like Jesus today. As you speak to us, as you instruct us, as you correct us, Lord, would we be open to listen and obey so that this world might know Jesus? Might we, O God, today, as a result of your Spirit speaking to us, love one another better? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Point number one that I want to give you. I'm going to give you three points here today. Point number one. Hey, pastor, how do I love my neighbor? Well, number one, know your neighbor. The old saying, to know me is to love me, might not apply here. I don't know. Donna thinks it does, but, you know, not everybody does. But there is truth to that, that you cannot really, honestly, love somebody if you don't know them, right? And if you take the time to get to know somebody, especially if the Spirit of God is at work in you, you will begin to love them, if you know them. All right. So point number one is know your neighbor. Now, to know your neighbor, you need to know their context, their world. You need to understand it, right? You need to understand a little bit, like, what's their worldview? How do they see the world? What do they value? Because if you're ever going to you know, bless them with a gift. Pastor Stephanie was talking about, you know, if they're, you know, sick or whatever, you know, bring them or something. Well, you need to know, like, what do they value? What do they like? How can you bring them a meal if you don't know what they like, right? You might think, oh, everybody likes lasagna. You take over a lasagna and you find out that they're, you know, lactose intolerant and can't have cheese. And they have to give it away or, or it makes them sick when they do eat it. So, you know, you got to know their values. You got to know your neighbor. You got to know their customs, I remember meeting a family for the first time and I could tell right from the get-go that they were, you know, of a different custom, different culture because of the way they were dressed, particularly the woman. And I remember trying out of the kindness of my heart when I met them, extended my hand and said, you know, welcome to Canada. Hello, you know, thank you. And I did it and the man shook my hand and as I reached out to shake the woman's hand, she did not in any way reach her hand forward awkwardly standing there only to realize after the fact that as a Muslim woman she is not to touch another man's hand. Well, I didn't know that at the time. Or I had forgotten. And so you need to know. You need to understand their customs. Maybe a little bit of their history. There might be some sensitive things that you should not talk about. Or jokes that you should not tell. You need to know your neighbor be great to know their family. Man, if anybody wants to come up to me and make friends with me, all you need to do is start coming up to me and start talking to me about the pictures you saw on Facebook of my grandson. You talk about my grandson, I love you. Period. (laughs) Right? Every grandparent knows that. It helps to know your neighbor. If you're going to love them, if you're going to extend a hand of love towards them, it helps to know your neighbor. Now, Pastor Mark, you said you were going to be talking about the Bible and examples. Well, here we go. One of the great leaders in the scriptures who uh, sets a really fine example over and over again is the Apostle Paul. You see, the Apostle Paul had this custom, if we can call it that. As he traveled around on his different missionary journeys, 
Whenever he would go into a town, he had the, the tradition or the custom of going in, and the first thing he would do was he would go to the local synagogue, which is a Jewish temple. You know that, right? He would go into the synagogue, and he would begin to, Scripture tells us this a number of times, he would, begin to, he would go in and begin to talk to them using the Hebrew Scriptures. We're talking about the Torah, the prophets, all right? He would talk using those Scriptures, and he would show them that Jesus is the Messiah. But he would always go in talking to them about their context. He would go in talking about the, the Hebrew Scriptures. That's where he would start building his bridge with them. Go in, and it is written, blah, 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 blah. But I want to show you now that Jesus is the Messiah. He has fulfilled that which was spoken long ago. Right? So he was doing He knew their context. He knew what was important to them. And it's, I love it. The scripture says, and many turned to Jesus. You have that over and over again. That many, not all, but many turned to Jesus. And then he goes to Athens. And as he goes into Athens, he goes up to this high place in Athens, this Greek open temple park kind of area. If you can imagine a park setting with a whole bunch of these little kind of altars all over the place. Maybe made out of marble or granite um, as would be in Athens. And uh, he goes up to this place called the Areopagus. And he goes up there and he begins to speak about, speak to them, sorry, Acts chapter 17 tells us. He begins to speak to them about their poets, their teachers, and their philosophy. And then he zeroed in. Once he had their attention speaking what they understood and what was their context, he then brought out the fact that in this area was one altar that was dedicated to the unknown God. And he used that opportunity to tell them about the God who he knew, the living God, the God of all creation, the maker of heaven and earth. And he answered the one question they had, and that is, who is this unknown God? But he began by speaking to them in their context. That's Acts chapter 17. And we also have this in the New Testament in the Gospels. You remember Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels in the, the New Testament? Matthew, interesting. You read the book of Matthew. He writes to the Jews. Right? So he wrote within Jewish context. Everything that Matthew writes... He writes from that Jewish context. Mark, on the other hand, the Gospel of Mark, he wrote to the Greeks. And so if you look at the way Matthew wrote and the way Mark wrote, you even look at the, the choice of words that they used. Matthew keeps going back to the ancient scriptures over and over again, and he uses old Hebrew words, where Mark actually mixes in a lot of the Greek language and doesn't rely so much on the Hebrew because he's writing to a Greek people. Um, the example, too, <laughs> look at the Gospel of Matthew. At the very beginning, Matthew starts with what? The genealogy of Jesus. He spends a whole chapter just telling us who is Jesus and verifying that Jesus was a fantastic Jew, came from the line of David. And he proves all of that in the first chapter. He starts out with a genealogy. He goes on to telling us about wise men seeking this great teacher, this great man. He talks continues. He talks about angels announcing. He talks about Joseph and Mary and who they were and where they came from. And them being forced by the authorities to travel for the census. He talks about a virgin birth. Kind of rings about Isaiah, right? He talks about persecution by authority. Talks about them, uh, Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus, fleeing to Egypt. All of these things are things that the Jews would have understood, would have been taught throughout their lifetime. That all of this would happen. And Matthew brings all of that back into the story to tell you, this is who was prophesied. He has come by using what they knew. Matthew did that throughout all of that. If you open the book of Mark, there's no mention of any of that. Not a bit of Jewish mention in any of it. All right? So don't go to the book of Mark on Christmas Eve and look at the Christmas story. It's not there. Because the Greeks did not have that history of who, where did you come from? It didn't matter. It's who you were now and who you've made yourself to be. All right? Have you been educated? Have, that's what was important to the Jews, uh, to, the, to the Greeks, sorry. In fact, in Jesus' temptation in the desert, 
over way in Mark chapter 4. So Matthew, sorry, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew takes three chapters just to tell you how Jesus got onto the scene. And then in Matthew chapter 4, he records the temptation in the desert. You remember that? Jesus' temptation in the desert. And he begins it by telling him, by telling the readers, that the question at hand or the debate that was happening in the desert was, if you are the Son of God. That was the question. That was important to the Jews. Because who is the Messiah? Who is the one who was called? Who is the one that is sent? Who is the Son of God that's been prophesied? And then Jesus' responses, and we've talked often about how important it is to use the scriptures to, you know, to, to face your temptations. Well, that's what Jesus did. We know that. Matthew records that. Mark doesn't. All right? But Matthew records that Jesus used the prophets. Jesus used the ancient writings. Matthew also talks about the places that all this temptation takes place. He talks about, and he calls it, the holy city. Very Jewish terminology there. He talks about the temple. Very most important place in Jewish thinking, right? In Jewish geography. It's not only the holy city, but man, the temple itself. And that's where this temptation takes place. And Matthew mentions all of that. The temptation given to worship Satan. It's a big deal, right? Who are you worshiping? That's Jewish thinking. So all of this was Jewish context and worldview. While Mark... When he talks about the temptation in the desert, I can read you everything that Mark says about the temptation in two verses. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. That's it. He says it happened, but that's it. Because why? That wasn't important to the Greeks. All right? Mark's got a story to tell. But they wouldn't have understood all those details, so Mark didn't include any of that. You see, because of the differences between us and our neighbors, whoever they might be, and however deep or far apart or close our differences might be, we need to build bridges if we're going to love our neighbor. You need to be ready to build a bridge if you're going to love your neighbor. We, as long-time followers of Jesus Christ, as most of us in this room are, you see, we have a spiritual worldview, or should I said a spirit-led worldview. I hope you do. We see things from this lens of what is Jesus doing in the world? That's kind of the lens that we look through, right? When something's happening, it's always, okay, what's Jesus doing here? It's the question we're always asking. Many of our friends and neighbors see things very differently, very differently. We need to understand that. We need to recognize that and use those differences. We need to bridge those differences to connect with our neighbors and show them another way. You know, I cannot count how many times I've had the opportunity to be talking to somebody, sharing my point of view with them, my God-centered worldview, and just in my conversation with them. And I've had people countless times say, you know, I never thought of it that way. Or I even had people just recently say, I wish I could see it that way. Because they were looking at a situation and looking at it, you know, bleak, dark, hopeless. And I had talked about, we're going to make through it. I'm going to make this storm because Jesus is there. And there's a brighter future ahead. I had them turn to me and say, man, I wish I could see it that way. And then it's the perfect opportunity to just say, you know what? If you allow God's Spirit to move in and transform you, you can see it that way too. But you've got to build that bridge, right? You've got to build that bridge. The other challenge that we have in speaking to our neighbors is that longtime followers of Jesus Christ have developed our own language, right? This little Christianese that we speak. I remember years ago when I was first going into the ministry, the pastor who I was working, or not working with, the pastor who was, I was under at that point, just getting ready to go into the ministry, I had opportunity to sit down with him and ask him a couple things about, you know, like, what can you tell me about the ministry that I didn't learn when I was in Bible school? And one of the things he encouraged me to do, and we've done this over the years, is make sure you stay connected with non-Christian people. 
Because it's really easy as a Christian to get into our little cloister, our little community where we're comfortable. And you know what? Salt needs to get out of the salt shaker, doesn't it? It's no good in the salt shaker. Light. Man, if we just kept the light on in here, the world would never see it. We need to shine in the darkness. Thank you for leading us in that song, Donna. I speak Jesus, where it's dark and where the shadows are strong. Right? We need to get out. But when we do speak, we need to make sure not to speak our own language. Because there's things we say <laughs> that they just had, would not, we might as well be speaking a foreign language sometimes. Right? There's no way they would understand. Now, I am not saying that you need to switch to being a foul-mouthed person to speak with foul-mouthed people. Not at all. But we do need to be careful to drop our churchy language if we're going to love our neighbor. All right? The other thing is, talking about language, is when you're speaking to somebody, you often see what's in their heart. Isn't that true? The Bible talks about that. Out of the, out of the heart, out of the mouth, comes the abundance of the heart, right? You can see what's in a person's heart when they speak. Well, you know what sometimes the world has seen come out of the mouth of Christians? You might be trying to do all the sweet talking and whatever. They can tell where your heart's at, right? When you begin to speak with them. Unfortunately, over the years, some churches or some people in churches have developed a little us and them mentality. We've kind of grouped the world into two groups. Those of us that attend church faithfully and those of them that never do. I don't know if we kind of think we're better than they are. I don't know where that's coming from. But let me remind you that but by the grace of God, friends, you and I are here. Amen? So let's drop that us and them mentality and let's love our neighbor knowing that God loves our neighbor and he has called us to love them. Amen? Let's do that. Now, if we were to go to the mission field, and there are some of us in this room that have, like overseas, or maybe you've come from another country to Canada, and there are some of you in here that have. And so you've, you've had to bridge differences in order to, to even live somewhere. Well, missionaries have done this over the years. You have to learn a new culture, often, a new language, and then minister within that context. We actually face that same challenge right here. Did you hear me? We face that same challenge right here. Because you and I need to bridge differences, just like a missionary does, if we're going to love our neighbors here within our own context. Missiologists, those who study missions and write theories and, you know, papers on missions and stuff, they have developed this what's called scale of evangelism. And I have a little diagram here to show you. This E scale of evangelism. E zero, it's a small little circle, is those people who live, or not live, but who are within the church walls. So they speak, they know our churchy language, they know our church culture, our church thinking, they, they understand all of that, but it's people, listen to this, this is crazy thinking, but it's real. People who are regularly in church, but are not followers of Jesus Christ. And so you and I need to reach out and love them, evangelize them too. Why? Because they need to come to a saving knowledge following Jesus Christ. Amen? So there is evangelism that needs to happen right within these eight, nine, ten walls. However, we don't have four walls here. We've got a whole lot more than that. Right? That's E0. E1 evangelism is those people who maybe have never entered the church or maybe just gone to funerals and weddings, but they're part of the culture that you live in. These are your neighbors, as we traditionally call your neighbor. Someone that lives on your street or across the street from you or, you know, whatever, right? They speak the same English you speak, um, but they don't have the church culture. You know what I'm saying? All right, so these are the E1 people that you need to love, that you need to reach out to. They grew up watching the same things you watched on TV, eating the same foods you eat, uh, reading the same books in school that you probably did. They just don't go to church. Except for, like I said, you know, funerals or weddings or whatever. 
Church culture is foreign to them. But Coburg culture, Northumberland culture, Grafton, you know, Brighton, wherever you live, that culture is familiar with them. But there are differences. And so that's the E1. E2 are people who are somewhat different than you are. They probably speak another language. Maybe even their mother tongue is other than what yours is. Um, so there are some differences here. They might eat different foods. Uh, they probably live here. They might even have a different religion. Church culture is completely foreign to them. Um, often these would be like first generation immigrants to Canada or a person who is maybe authentically First Nation, practicing First Nation, right? They're culturally different. They understand the same language you speak. There are some similarities, but culturally there's quite a few differences already. All right, so that's another people group that we need to love, but you can see that the, the distance you need to reach, the bridges you need to build are a little bit bigger, a little bit broader, a little bit more specific, right? So be ready. Be ready for that. If you want to love your neighbor, as Jesus called you to do that. And then E3, you can see, is totally disconnected. These are people who are in no way similar to you. They don't speak your language. They don't understand your culture. They don't know why you dress the way you do. They don't know why you smile when you do, because they smile at different times for different reasons. It's just culturally completely different. And uh, boy, they are sometimes harder to reach. But you know what? When God calls us to love, he called us to love everybody. And soon, we're going to be looking at that verse, not today, but the next Sunday or two, we're going to be looking at that verse, go into all the world and make disciples. And maybe E3 is on your list as well. So here's the question. What differences do you need to overcome to love your neighbor? Do you know your neighbor enough to know where do they fit in? And what do you need to do to bridge the differences? Missionaries have been doing it for years. You and I can do it as well. Amen? Do you hear that? Missionaries have been doing it for years. You and I can do it as well right here. Amen? We need to love our neighbors. Do you know your neighbor's name? We have a name tag on today, but your neighbor doesn't. Do you know their name? Do you know who lives with them in their house? Do you know where they work, what they drive? What are their hobbies? When's their birthday? What are their religious experiences? What are their beliefs? One little trick, if you're on Facebook, is creep your neighbor on Facebook. <laughs> If you know their name, you'll find out all sorts of things about them. You creep me on Facebook, you'll find out all sorts of things about me. And you'll get to know my grandson's name and make friends with me. All right. <laughs> so you need to know your neighbor. The second step, not the second point here, but the second step in knowing your neighbor is to be in relationship with your neighbor. That's beyond just knowing them. But God calls us to be in relationship with them. Amen? Because when you're in relationship with them is when you can actually begin to make a difference. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 22. I'm going to read you a couple verses here. Uh, Jesus speaking. Question was put to him by the Pharisees and Jesus answered in verse 37. Matthew 22, 37. He says, You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's the first and great commandment. Verse 39, and the second is just like it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. And I think that goes way beyond just knowing your neighbor. That's being in relationship with them. Amen? And then Romans chapter 13, verse 8, uh, 8 to 10. And I want to read these verses to you. Romans 13, verses 8 to 10. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. If there's any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you should love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. You see how important this is? God calls us now, I know that in our society, it's all about individualism, and I got my own thing, and leave me alone. Scripture doesn't let you do that. Scripture does not let us do that. The Spirit of God does not let us do that. We must obey. We must love our neighbors. 
Luke chapter 10, verse 33 and 34. You know the story of the Samaritan? Listen to it in the context of loving your neighbor. Luke chapter 10, verse 33 and 34. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came to where he was, and when he saw him, that man who had been beat up by robbers and thrown in the ditch. You see what it says here, verse 33? And when he saw him, he had compassion. Compassion. That's not just, I know him. But when you have compassion on somebody, it's something that moves you. Compassion is an emotional term. It's something that moves you. All right. Verse 34. So he went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring, oil on, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his animal, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. And we know he paid the bill. Man, that's the example set to us. This whole story Jesus is telling is in answer, what's the question? Who's my neighbor? Can we just dream for a second? What would this look like in your neighborhood? What would this look like in my neighborhood? And I know some of you are doing this. I've heard your stories and I commend you for it. But this is a call to every single follower of Jesus Christ. This is how we ought to live. Any less than this and we're not fulfilling the commandment. It's really that simple. This is how we ought to live. Compassionately loving others, period. That means doing something about it. All right. You're hearing it. In relationship, do you remember Luke chapter 15? There's three stories told there, the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. Well, just the first two, there's this great concept. The third one has it in there as well, but when the person who's lost the coin or the sheep finds it. What do they do? The first thing they do, it says right there, and they gathered all their neighbors together and had a party. <laughs> they celebrated with their neighbors, those who lived around them. Friends, next time you have a reason to party, <laughs> whatever it happens to be, why don't you try inviting your neighbors over and let them share your joys with you. And when you hear from them, that something exciting has happened. They've got a new job or they, you know, they finally got that answer that they were looking for. What a, man, celebrate with them. That's a perfect excuse for you to make a plate of cookies that they're not allergic to because you know them. And you take them over and celebrate with them. That's the example that's given to us that we ought to follow. Romans chapter 15 has got this really interesting little line in there. Romans chapter 15, verse 2, <coughs> says this. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to his edification. It says that that's what Jesus did to us. He did everything to build us up, to make us happy, to please us. And now it's our turn to please others. Get your eyes off yourself. Get your eyes off your mirror and see what you can do to please others, to make them happy. Maybe mow their lawn or give them a ride or I don't know. You know them or do you? You ought to know your neighbor. All right, number two. Number one is know your neighbor. Number two, intercede for your neighbor. This is where it becomes God's story. Hopefully, your motivation in number one was a God story. We're godly motivated. But you know what? Intercede. Compassion. Compassionate prayer for your neighbor. First Samuel chapter 12, near the end of Samuel's days, as a servant of God in the temple, 
Samuel's now going to be ushered out. The king is going to, the first king, right, is going to be brought in. That's King Saul to the kingship. Well, 1 Samuel chapter 3, Samuel here turns to the people of God and he makes one promise to the people that he has faithfully served since he was just a child in the temple. And he says this to them. Moreover, as for me, verse 23, far be it for me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and right way. I think he sets an example for us. We ought to be ever praying, never ceasing to pray for our neighbors. In the New Testament, along with the saints in Thessalonica, we are called as followers of Jesus Christ, and you know these words well. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 and verses that follow that. That's exactly what Samuel did. Paul goes on to say to those in Rome, he says that he was praying for them without ceasing. He says to, Sim to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3, Timothy, I'm praying for you without ceasing. That's quite the commitment. Quite the commitment. But I think that's what we're called to. And I've heard people, and I've, you know, I'll be honest, it's happened to me too. Sometimes after a few minutes of praying, it's like you run out of things to pray for. Just being honest. While I was preparing this a couple weeks ago, it really hit me that, man, I should get a post-it pad out and start writing down names of people. And maybe you already do this. I don't know. And whenever I start running out of things to pray for, just open my eyes and start reading my post-it pads. Man, there's a lot of people that I know, a lot of people that I should be praying for. I could spend the whole day praying. I know the names of the mechanic and all the staff that work there. I know the names of a couple of the doctors and nurses at the hospital. Staff over at the Golden Plow. Who do you know? Who ought you to be praying for? Think about that. Pray without ceasing. Pray for your neighbor without ceasing. And this brings us to a, a not going to say sad announcement, but we want to take the opportunity today to thank Glenn and Hope. Are you here with us today? Yep, there you are. We want to thank Glenn and Hope. We're talking about praying for each other, praying for our neighbors. Glenn and Hope, for a whole lot of years, have faithfully called us to pray for others. Glenn and Hope, you've made it easy for us to pray for others. Your constant emails, your reminders, your Saturday morning prayers. You've made it easy for us to obey Jesus and pray for others. You have been beautiful instruments in the hands of God among us here at Church on the Hill, and we thank you. And uh, tomorrow is going to be their last day coordinating the prayer ministry. Shortly they're going to be moving out of the area, and uh, they have to give that up. But you see, it's people like you that have made it possible. I mean, you even said easy. I chose that word intentionally. You've made it easy for us to be faithful in praying, and we thank you for that. And following the service, we do have a cake for them out there. And also want to make a commitment from this church, and I hope everybody can join me in this commitment. And if you do, you can say a big amen at the end of this, that we're going to pray for you. All right. There's a video that uh, I hope we have queued up that says, In the name of Jesus, it's God of the impossible. Listen to the songs of this word, if we can get the video going. There we go. Audio. I'll be right back. I speak the name of Jesus over you. In your hurting, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move. I speak the name, cause it's all that I can do. In desperation, I'll seek heaven and pray this for you. I pray for your healing, the circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee. In Jesus' name, I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life. In Jesus' name, 
I chose that song because we need to know, we need to understand when we're praying for our neighbors and even praying for each other, as I hope you are committed to do, that often the biggest need we're praying for isn't for healing, isn't for provision, isn't for direction, but rather for salvation. And that's what only Jesus can do. And that's why we need to pray for our neighbors. You see, if they have a healing need, you might be able to take them to the doctor. If they have a provisional need, you might be able to provide a meal. But we need to recognize that their biggest need is to know, to love, to serve the Lord the rest of their lives. And that's why we pray for them. Because only God can do that. Intercession, by the way, is a very certain type of prayer. Talking about interceding, right? Not just praying, but interceding. Interceding is a very certain type of prayer. Defined this way in the dictionary, a number of different dictionaries I looked at. To intervene on behalf of another. To mediate between two people in an attempt to reconcile differences. Or to entreat, in, entreaty in favor of another. You see, when you're interceding for someone in prayer, you're bringing their needs, their situation, their darkness, their desires to the Father, who you know so well. And that's why in intercession we often cry for them. We beg on their behalf. We plead the Father for them. Sometimes we even make a deal with God on their behalf. In intercessory prayer, you are at the throne of God because they need Him now. That's intercessory prayer. Jesus shows us this in John chapter 17 where he prays for his disciples. And then he goes on to pray for all believers including you and me. Jesus prayed that the perfect will of God would be fully realized in the disciples and all who were following Jesus at that time, but also for all who would ever follow him. And so that's what we pray. So how do you love your neighbor? Well, you get to know them, be in relationship with them. And number two, you intercede for them. This brings us to number three, and this is rescue your neighbor. I'm not talking about a lasagna. I'm not talking about, you know, doing whatever. We're talking rescue. And that is because once you begin to pray for them, so number one, you got to know your neighbor. Number two, now you're praying for them, and you're praying for them without ceasing, Scripture says. That's what we're called to, right? Pray for our neighbors without ceasing. And then comes point number three is where you rescue your neighbor. It was Jesus' mission on this earth, and he said it a number of times. His mission on this earth was to seek and to save the lost. That's a rescue mission. He wasn't here just to be nice to people. So just being a nice Christian, even demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit, it's not enough. Sorry. We're here on a mission. We're called to seek and to save the lost. In Luke chapter 19, we have the story of this vertically challenged individual. Right, Neil? Um, I said I wouldn't do that. Okay, I'm sorry. I told him I'd be preaching about Zacchaeus this morning. So, And this gentleman was incredibly interested in following, or at least getting to know, this famous Jesus. Well, Jesus knew this guy, and so he invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house. Zach, we'll call him that for short. Okay. He repents of his crooked ways. He does. Zach completely repented of his evil ways. And scripture puts it this way and salvation came to his house. Why did this happen? Verse 10 says it very clearly. As Jesus said, For this the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Friends, you and I are on a rescue mission. Too often, we forget that the people around us are lost, like sheep without a shepherd. We forget. You see, in our society, when someone finds a stray dog, there are all sorts of organizations around who will help to adopt the pet. There's humane society, there are animal shelters, many, willing, many people willing to foster a pet, but what are we doing about the people who've gone astray? What are we doing about 
those who are lost. Back in the early 60s, there was a young man who was a commercial pilot for American Airlines, and he was a bit of an airline mechanic as well at that point. He helped out once a missionary friend who was serving down in Mexico by fixing his plane for him. And while he was down there, he began to realize the need for pilots and for aviation mechanics in missions. Well, he went on to go to Wheaton College to prepare for doing the work of God, and there he met his lovely wife, and they married and moved to Ecuador, and there he built a home. And he built a guest house for other missionaries and a radio center, because back in the day they didn't have cell phones, and he built a radio center to serve the missions work in that part of Central America. And during one of his missions flights, probably start queuing the video about right now, he found the Aka Indians, this native indigenous group there, and he started to reach out to them with gifts and with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he finally had opportunity to go in and land the plane near the Wadani River, uh, the, the village, sorry, Wadani Village. That's the name of the people group there. And go in and make his first contact. Here's a video clip of Nate Saint, the man who I'm talking about, saying goodbye to his wife Marge and his son Steve as he heads out on what would be his first flight to meeting the Wadani people but it also is Nate's last flight ever. If you know the story, if you want to read the rest of the story, it's in Beyond Gates of Splendor, or this movie called End of the Spear, which is based on the video. And I want you to see what he says to his son, and then I'll come right back up. Go ahead, let's cue this video. <sighs> Do you know how far away the sun is? 93 million miles. You know that that's a fraction of how much your daddy loves you? Is the world on the attack? Will you defend yourself? Will you use your guns? Son, we can't shoot the Wadani. They're not ready for heaven. We are. Son, we can't shoot the Wadani. They're not ready for heaven. We are. We must go out and love our neighbor at all costs. That was his last flight. They went in, they got on the beach, they met the Wadani, and the Wadani did attack. There was a misunderstanding, they didn't speak their language. And the missionaries were speared to death by the Wadani. Gave up their life. And the last things he had said to his son is, they're not ready for heaven, but we are. We need to love our neighbors at all costs. But, listen to this, and I want us to catch this. And this is why I, I chose this video clip. You cannot afford to ruin your testimony with your neighbor. Because they're not ready for heaven. So we need to do everything we can at all costs to love them and to show them the love of the Father. Love them right. Love them genuinely. Love them at all costs. If I may go back to, the, to Jesus and the example he set in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, Jesus and his disciples go on a missions trip, literally. They went on a missions trip. They go across the lake. They left Jewish territory. They went across the lake to Greek territory, to the Decapolis. And there is one man, listen to the story, Matthew chapter 5, Mark chapter 5, sorry. There's one man there who is lost, who is demon-possessed, and Jesus makes the trip across the lake to set him free. It's a rescue mission. So they get in the boat, they meet the guy on the other side of the lake, they cast out the legion of demons into about 2,000 pigs who try to swim, but 
Kids, let me tell you something. Pigs can't swim. The Bible says so. I know it. I've raised pigs. They can't swim. Okay. There's a whole teaching actually here on spiritual warfare, by the way, about the casting out of the demons and everything else. We're not going to go there today. But Jesus, in the end, he heals the man. Interesting, the Bible says that they clothed the man because demon-possessed, he was running around naked. And then they commission him. Jesus sends him out as an evangelist to reach, to share the gospel with those ten cities in the area there, the Decapolis area. And obediently he goes and proclaims in those ten cities all that Jesus first has done for him. Interesting, verse 20 says, and they marveled. That is his hearers who heard his story, they marveled. He was naked and he needed clothes. This man was living in the rocks, he needed a proper home. This man was living alone, he needed to, a community. These were some of his needs, but his greatest need, and you need to see this, his greatest need, his greatest need was for freedom from the power of Satan. And that's why Jesus went to set him free. It was a rescue mission. I need to say this clearly. People who are living without Jesus are not okay. We cannot. I don't want to take this lightly. We cannot just leave them alone. But we can't shoot them either. Because they're not ready for heaven. Remember, no one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus said. And if your does, neighbor does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and if you know your neighbor, you know if they do or don't. Point number one. If they don't know Jesus, they have a desperate need, and you know the one who can rescue them. Do you love your neighbor? If we love our neighbor, we will do all we can to help their need, whatever that need might be. We'll come alongside them and allow God to bless them through us. Philippians chapter 4 has this very famous verse that a lot of Christians know. And it says this, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You ever heard that before? Yes. Do you know the context of this? And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. Does that mean because, well, if you go to church regularly, my God will supply all your need? Or if you're a follower of Jesus, my God will supply all your need? Is that what it means? Let me tell you the context. Paul is speaking to the Philippians. And he commends them on being so faithful in giving to him and to his ministry. And he says, and you gave even beyond what you could handle. You gave more than you could and, notice the first word, and my God will supply all your needs. It's when we give that God pours his blessing through us. It's not when you go to church. I'm glad you're here, but you hear what I'm saying? As we give, God gives through us and just, he keeps pouring out that blessing. Keeps pouring out that blessing. I'd like to call the uh, worship team up at this time. Scripture calls us to give to those in need. Lend without asking to get it back. Lend without asking to get it back. Now that could be painful. But if God's going to supply all my needs as I give, what am I worried about? Let's be real. What am I worried about? Fight for those who cannot fight for themselves. James chapter 1 verse 27 defines pure religion as this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and keep oneself unspotted. That is, clean, not one spot, from the sins of this world. That's pure religion. Caring for the orphans and the widows, and you keep your nose clean. Literally. Well, that's how we love our neighbor. We know our neighbor. We love our neighbor. And we rescue our neighbor. That's how we love them. Amen?
I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to uh, get Donna here and the worship team to lead us in one more song that really fits as a prayer for us. And after this, we're going to be heading out. There's hot dogs to trap you on the way out. I mean, to feed you on the way out. But there's also a cake. And so we're going to ask, uh, once we move the cake, I think we're going to either keep it in the foyer, move it in the, out in the outside, I'm not sure what we're doing. But Glenn and Hope, would you stay near the cake and that way people can give you a hug and speak to you? They're not leaving us yet, but they are, as of tomorrow, submitting the, uh, the coordination of the prayer ministry because they're getting ready to leave. But, so that you'll still see them around, but would you thank them for helping us to pray for our neighbors, all right, as you go outside. Donna, lead us in our closing song, and after the song, everybody will be dismissed. with your presence. Fill us with your power and your strength. Help us to go and love our neighbor. Show us what we need to do and give us strength to do it. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.